importantly, we are here to celebrate Jesus. We are here to glorify his name. And so, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Most of us can quote it. And Ethan, if you would, put it in the NIV. And Ethan, why don't you just stay and I'll clear it with your mom. You'll be okay. And so, put it in uh, chapter 29, verse 11. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares who? The Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a what? A hope and a future. The King James says to give you peace and an expected end. But he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. A future. It's a future. It's not just, this is, it's all part of the plan. But there's a future out there. It's the expected end. There's always an end. There will always be an end on this earth. This earth will always have an end. But there's never an end in heaven. There's never going to be an end in heaven. We're promised to that. We're told of that. There will never be an end in heaven. For in this world, I'll just go right into my message. Go to John 16, 33, in the Amplified. And then we'll go back to Jeremiah here in a minute. Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you will have tribulation, trials, distress, and frustration. But be of good cheer. What does that mean? What does be of good cheer mean? Get happy. Get happy. Come on now, get happy. He didn't say get sad. He didn't say get mad. He said, but be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. For I, and take courage. Take courage. For I have, I love this, take courage, be confident, be certain, and be undaunted. For I have overcome The what? The world. So take courage, for I have overcome Ebola, and I have already overcome ISIS, and I've already overcome debt, and I've already overcome depression, and I've already overcome cancer. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. See, the world's full of all that. Heaven is not. None of that's in heaven. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And I love this part. And I have deprived it. I have deprived it of its power to harm you and conquered it for you. I have deprived it of its power to harm you. Grandma Vell always said this one. I always heard this little analogy she would say. She would say there's two dogs. And and you can only feed one dog at a time. You can't feed both dogs. You can either feed your spiritual dog or then you got the flesh dog. You can't feed both dogs because they're both fighting for the food. But Jesus, he deprived that dog of the world of food. He deprived it of its power to harm you. It's deprived. Because his plan for you has and always will be. It has and it always will be. It's always been involved and centered around Jesus. It has. From the foundation of the world, he has known who you are. From the very foundation of the earth, before it, before, when he said, let there be light, he was thinking about Dave. When he said, when he said, water be, he was thinking about Ken. See? 6,000, 10 million, however many years you want to be, he was still thinking about you. And he was thinking about me. 
The plans for your life do not involve you being harmed. They do not involve you being harmed. They involve you being prosperous. Prosper just does not, we always think, when we think of being prospered, we always think about this. It's more than just money. Money is just the one little thing of it. Prosper means I can go, I can lay my head down to sleep and sleep in perfect peace. Prosper means I have no guilt attached to it. He gave me the gift of no condemnation. No condemnation. I can go to sleep and I can sleep like a baby knowing that I am at peace with God. That I am at peace with God. I can get on an airplane. I got on one last night. I know some people that I travel, they've been traveling 20 years. They're always afraid to fly. I can get on an airplane because I know I, have, I am at peace with God. In the world, there will be trouble. There's always going to be trouble. The trouble isn't going away. It says the greater the darkness, the greater the light. The greater the light. The world, there will always be something. There will always be a new disease. I mean, think about it. If you look back, if you study history in the 20s or the turn of the century, measles, man, that was going to destroy America was measles. Now you hardly hear about it because there's always going to be something. The enemy's always going to try to throw something at you. He's always trying going to jab you and try to make you shocked by what happened. But God's plan for my life, God's plan for your life, there's no harm. There's no harm. There's no harm. You know, when Hannah had the baby... And Hannah had the baby. I did not have the baby. (laughs) Hannah had the baby. When Hannah gave birth to the baby, I was support staff. They broke her water, and then the contractions. I've learned more about the body than I've ever wanted to know and ever will ever want to know. I was like, holy cow. Do you know that that little girl over there, a little side note, she has about the same amount of hormones as Hannah has. When I heard that that day, I said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> that baby has the same amount of hormones as Hannah does. And I've seen that on display a little. But it's fine. It's fun. But they broke Hannah's water. And when they did those contractions, they all started. Those contractions, man, they were already starting, but now they're really starting. And, they, and she was in pain. And in turn, so was I. I was not allowed to touch her. I was not, I was not allowed to speak. And that's a hard thing for me, Shauna. I wasn't allowed to talk. And in my family, see, her family, comfort is different than comfort is in my family. My mom and grandma, have you ever given them both a hug? When they hug you, man, it's like they're burping the baby. It's like they packed. So there I am, her water breaks, these contractions are starting, Rick, and I start patting her. Because to me, that's comforting. It's like, stay in the game, stay in the game. Just stay in it, stay in it. And she goes, and she goes, she goes, don't touch me. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And don't talk. I want nobody talking right now. And it's four in the morning. I'm thinking, oh, dear God, you've got to come through right now. Either let this baby be born right now or bring the rapture. <laughs> we need something. And so Hannah, she's there, and she's just lying there in so much pain. And there's nothing I can do. I could try to talk her through it. She doesn't want to hear that. I could try to comfort her the way that I know to comfort. She doesn't want that. So I just stood there. I just stood there. And then about five minutes later, she goes, I think I want the epidural. (laughs) Mind you, I did not say, I said, if that's what you want. If that's what you want, I think you might, I think that might be good. She got the epidural. They come in, they do this epidural, they do everything. Because she had some people telling her, oh, you can tough it out. Just tough it out. 
And I'm thinking, you can't even handle a toothache. But I didn't tell her that. I didn't tell her that. And so she gets this epidural. You want to talk about an easy witness for her. She gets this epidural, man. If they didn't know we were Christians then, they knew by then. Because after it, she's saying, this is the best gift from God ever. This is a gift from God. This is wonderful. And she had it at 4.30 in the morning. The baby wasn't born until 5 to 6 that night. But she laid there, and what did you do 90% of the time? She slept. She rested. The, those contractions, man, you could see the monitor. Those contractions, man, they were spiking, and they were getting big. And Hannah's over there just sleeping away. She's just sleeping away. She's snoring. She's just at ease. You know, here's the truth of life. There will be contractions in life. Because God's got a plan for your life, and there will be a contraction in life. There will be times where there will be pressure, and there will be expanding, and there will be growing pains in your life. It will be the same here at this church. There will always be a contraction in life. But he said that he came to prosper you and not to harm you. And it said that the kingdom of God is what? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And what it does is, Jesus said, for I am going away, but the comforter will come. And see, there is pains in life. Life can be painful. But the Holy Spirit comes in and he gives you that epidural. He gives you that epidural. The contractions are still going on. The change is still happening, but you're at no pain. You're at no pain. You can breathe through it easy. You can sleep in it. You can rest in it. I asked if I could have one. Because <laughs> here I am, I'm the one freaking out. And I'm, I mean, I have all these things. I'm like, can they give me one? I would like to enjoy this. But that's how life can be. That's what we have in life. Because the Bible says, the Bible says that, O oh, grave, where is thy victory? And O oh, death, where is thy sting? Where is your pain? I don't feel your pain. Because, because we got righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost flowing through us. Because Jesus said, in me, in me, not in yourself, not in what you can think up, but in me, you will, you may have. This was before he died. Now it's you will have, or you do have, perfect Peace. You know that word perfect? I'll give you a little Greek lesson. I used to say, I used to say, I don't know no Greek. Now I do know Greek. The Greek word telo is the same word. It means it's where we get the word perfect. We get the word from the Greek word a telo. It's the same word we get from finished, supplied. And completed. So in me you will have perfect, complete, finished peace. It's already settled. You have that peace. That peace that passes and transcends all understanding. It goes above and beyond what you can ever try to think. You can have a peace. Yeah, you're still experiencing some contractions. You're still experiencing some of that. But you were at peace. You know, at the very end of it, Hannah, she still had to push. She still had to push. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. But she had to push. We were there. She tried to get, the, the nurses were like, you need to count for her. And they start going, you're like her coach, so you need to count. So I started, I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, breathe. And then the nurse is like, no, think of like a waltz. Think of like a waltz. So I'm like, one, two, three. And then somebody said something, and I got all messed up where I was, so I go back to one. <laughs> and then Hannah, see, she has the epidural. She's at peace, but she's still getting a little frustrated. And she goes, you don't have to restart every time. <laughs> so I made my mom count. I'm like, Mom, you just count for me. I can't deal with 
It's like I can't do this. It's saying I can't, I can't do it. Because I also had to hold her head up, and I, I just couldn't do it. So I'm like, Mom, you got to count. So then my mom starts counting. Well, there towards the end, everybody's like starting to be a cheerleader. Well, my mom's like a natural cheerleader. So my mom's like, my mom's going seven, eight. You got it. You can do it. You do it. You're doing so great. Come on, come on, come on. And I look at Hannah. She's still going. And I go, 10. <laughs> and she goes, oh. <sighs> Let me tell you, you have a coach in the Holy Spirit who will coach you through this. He will navigate you through these times in your life. He will navigate you for, he will not miscount. He will count right on beat and he will keep it flowing. We can face all these things, tribulation, trials, distress, frustration. We have perfect peace. It's done and completed. There is no harm in my life. I don't have to be afraid of pain and harm because he's deprived it of its power to harm me. It's deprived. It's starving. It's not even going to get fed anymore. There's so many times that we try to fulfill this all within ourselves, don't we? Or then when certain things happen, then we start thinking, if I would have been this guy... Or if I'd have done this. Or if I'd have only handled this better. Or if I'd have been nicer to these people. Or if I'd have done this. Regret is harmful. Regret is harmful. Condemnation is harmful. Guilt is harmful. Depression is harmful. Those things come in and they will harm your soul. They will harm you. They will harm you. But perfect peace, perfect peace, that word peace, the best way to think of peace is ease. It's ease. I got a peaceful, easy feeling. Thank you, Ken. But see, you can have that. Everything around you may feel like it just got blown up, but you can have that. We have that. Ethan, uh, do me a favor and go to, this wasn't on your list, go to 1 Corinthians 14.33 in the NIV. Because, see, we get confused, don't we? Things in life can confuse us. Well, if I'd have just prayed harder, or if I'd have just done this. And see, confusion and disorder, they're the exact same thing. It says, for God is not a God of disorder. But of what? Peace. 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 It says that the steps of the righteous are ordered and counted by the Lord. They are ordered and they are counted. God, God does not do anything in disorder. That's why he said, for I know the plans. A plan is in order. If you have a plan, you start from one and you work all the way down. You start from one. It's part of the plan. You go off the plan. But see, in life, sometimes we don't get to see the plan. He said that he knows the plans. It doesn't say, I'm giving you the plans. But in Joel, it said, in Joel, what is it? Joel 2.28 says that old men will dream dreams. And young men or women will see visions. See, you and I, we might not always get the plans that we all want, but, we can, but you, you will all see visions. I'll call you all young. You will all see visions. You will all dream dreams. And then sometimes we get, but sometimes disorder will come in and we'll see that vision. And then so we'll start making a plan in our mind how that vision is supposed to play out. And so then when distresses and frustrations and trials come up, we're thinking, well, well, that wasn't, and it totally changes what our plan was, we thought, well, that wasn't part of it. It was part, the world's plan for you is always to harm you. But God's plan for you is to always prosper you and establish you. He's got the plan. It's in the future. You have a future. Say, I have a future. 
Say, I have a vision. I have a dream. I have a dream. But God has the plan. And that's where the faith comes in. That's where faith comes in. That's where that peace just seals up your heart. And you just know. No one's going to take it away from you. It passes all understanding. You know, the world, the concept of peace doesn't make sense. Hope doesn't make sense. The world knows about happiness, but they do not know about joy. Because peace, hope, joy, love, they are all Jesus. It's his very name. They are all Jesus. Jesus is a part of your future. He's a part of your present, and he's a part of your future. But he was also a part of your past because when he died on the cross from you and he hung there, he paid for everything. Amen. Past, present, and future Amen. in your life. He paid for it all. I've learned this much in 30 years, I guess. I'm 30, right, Mom? That means you're 30 years older. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. And Dad. Oh, you're 28. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't know how to do math. But, but you know what? I've learned this much because I've gone through things. Who here has just gone through stuff? Your stuff's different than my stuff. My stuff's different from your stuff. I may not be able to say that I know exactly how everyone feels in here, but you can't say you know exactly how I feel because we've all experienced different stuff. But there's been times in my life when stuff has happened to me that it was all my fault. And I blamed and I beat up myself. And I brought harm to myself. I brought it to myself. Who here has done that? We just beat up ourselves. You know the hardest person on, your, on you is you? That's the truth. I mean, I have a friend of mine. I dearly love her, but she talks to herself. And when she gets mad, she'll go, oh, Kathy. And she'll start scolding herself out loud. And I'm like, man, that's how we do sometimes to ourselves internally. Man, I wish we'd have done that. I wish you'd have done that. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. But Jesus did it all. That's why it's important in life that we know our who from our do. I feel like a rock star in the air. That's why it's important in life that you know your who from your do. And I'll explain that. You know who you are in Christ. What you've done in life or what you may be struggling with and what you may be doing is not who you are. That is not who you are. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am not the righteousness of Jimmy in Jimmy. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There may be things that I have done that I am not proud of, but they are not who I am. They do not define me. They do not define you. That is not part of God's plan. It is not part of the plan. But see, when we've learned as a body of believers, our who from our do, and when we learn that, because see, there's two people involved in the plan that you have, that God has for you. The first person we've already talked about is Jesus. He's involved in every part of the plan that God has for you. The second person involved in the plan that God has for you is others. It's not me. I'm not really even a part of the plan. The things that I have gone through in my life, you go through them so that eventually on the other side of them, you can help somebody else go through the same thing. You can help someone go through the same thing. And that's what we do as a body of believers is we love Christ, we share Christ, we share him out, and in turn we love other people. We love other people. 
We love other people. I said we love other people. Freely you have received, so freely give. You love other people. You can let things that have happened to you in your life define you. You can let that define you, and you can just let that bury you. Or you can, or you can be like a refining fire. Well, what's the bird that comes out of the fire? The phoenix. It's mythical, but it's, it works here. You can be like that phoenix that comes out of those flames. And you can be that. You can, we can rise above where we are because we know who we are in Christ. We know who we are. And when you know who you are, then you know what way to go. You may not know the exact, you may not know exactly what town you're going, but because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, it's all going to be right here. You'll just feel it. You'll just feel it. You'll just know it. You'll just know. Because God is not the God of disorder. Cancer's disorder. Depression's disorder. Fear is a disorder. The Bible says fear brings torment. It brings torment. I knew somebody one time, they were so afraid, if they would see a rain cloud in the sky, they wouldn't go anywhere. They wouldn't go anywhere. They let that fear just tie them up and chain them up. And they're good people. But that fear just held them in so long that, I mean, if they saw a rain cloud, they were going to the basement. They were going to the basement. Don't go to the basement. We don't have to go to the basement because we know that wherever I go, he goes. If God is for me, who can be against me? Who can harm me? Who can hurt me? Who can hurt me? I mean, we've got, you know what, this church, when did it burn down? 2000. So 14 years ago, this November, the church burnt down. And it was red coals. I mean, it just wasn't like a half of it burnt down, was it, Rick? I mean, it was, it was in ashes. It was down for the count. And most people thought we were down for the count, too. Most people thought we should just split, go our separate ways. It was a good try. We gave a good try. But we didn't do it, did we, Dad? We didn't do it. We knew God had a bigger plan than some fire. God had a bigger deal than some flames. Are we exactly where we thought we would be 14 years later? Maybe not. But are we in a better place now than we were 14 years ago? We are. We are. See, don't ever judge where you are currently right now with, with that's how God feels about you. No. No. That's not how God feels about you. God's plan is to prosper you, to give you a hope in a future, to bring you to the expected end, to bring you through it. That's God's plan for us. That's God's plan for us. Hebrews 12, 2 in the Amplified, and Ethan's going to pull it up. It says, looking away from all that will distract. So let's say this, looking away from Ebola, looking away from Ferguson, looking away from looking away from ISIS, looking away, and all these things I'm mentioning, they're all real. They're all real things, but we look away from them because they will distract you. Looking away from all those to Jesus, to Jesus, the, the leader and the source of our faith. King James says, the author and the finisher of your faith. Now, a couple, months, a couple years ago, Dan and Shauna built a house. And when they built the house, they had to lay down the foundation first. And then they had to frame it up. They didn't finish it out first. It had to be framed up first. At the very end, then the finishing carpenters came in. 
or Dan, and they put in the moldings, and they put in the locks, and they painted it, and they did everything like that. They finished it out. Jesus is the author of your life. He is the framer of your life. But he also finished it. He's the finisher. He's the perfecter. He made it all line up and straight, and he made it perfect. None of these things in life, we always think, well, man, I got to start this, or I got to keep this going. If I don't go to church this week, God's going to get me. Who here's ever thought that? I was raised by that man. God's going to get you. God's going to get you. If you don't pay your tithe this week, you will run out of gas on the way home and you won't have enough money to put in your gas tank and you deserve it. <laughs> you deserve it. Or, or, or if you don't pray before you preach, you're going to get up here and you're going to trip on something and fall and make a big fool of yourself and that's all your fault because you did not prepare. I used to know a preacher, he would, I used to know a preacher, I mean, I used to think he was it, man, because he'd get up there and he would say, I prayed eight hours a day, or I prayed nine hours a day, and I think, man, there's no way I can ever compete with that. There's no way I could ever try to do that. There's no way. I get bored after like 10 minutes. I start praying and I'm like, I'm trying to think of things, but that's who I am. That wasn't who he is. But see, Jesus, he's the author. It's not another man that's the author of your faith. It's Jesus. He's the author of our faith. But he just didn't leave us with the first word. He brought it. He took it all and he completed it all. He completed it all. It's complete. It's perfect. It's done. The due date, when Hannah found out she was pregnant, or as people would say, you're having a baby. I wasn't doing anything. But when they found out that Hannah, when we found out that Hannah was pregnant, the first date we had was September 29th. So I took my calendar down at work, and I wrote, due date, September 29th, and I circled it. And I put a dot on it, and that was it. We go to the doctor, what, a month later? And the doctor, the first doctor we see, she says, no, that's not the due date. The due date's October the 6th. That's the due date. So I go back to work. Take out my pen. Scratch it out September 29th. Go to the next month, October 6th. Put a circle on it. And I just wrote, and I just wrote D-Day. <laughs> that's the date, October 6th. That's D-Day. It kind of was like D-Day. <laughs> That's D-Day. So then six weeks later, it wasn't a good fit with the doctor we had, so somebody else recommended us to a different doctor. So we go see this doctor. We go into this doctor. We tell him what the doctors all said and what the due dates and the math and how you figure all that out. What that all says, he says, no, it's October the 3rd. <laughs> but that doesn't work for my calendar. <laughs> Have you ever done that in life? It doesn't fit into my plan. It doesn't fit in. So I go back to work. And finally what I did, I scratched out October 6th. I go back up to that Friday, October 3rd. I put a big giant question mark on there and I circled it. I was like, okay. So then that was what, March? And so then we get going. Hannah just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I just felt like I was with a ticking time bomb. Oh, she looks great now, Kim. She looks great. But the more, the bigger that baby grew, the tired Hannah got, the more, now? huh? <laughs> she looked now? great before. She looked great now. She's great. She looked great then. She's just great. She's great. But anyway, we get up to September 29th, the first due date. No baby. Okay, that doctor was right. So we come up to October 3rd, no baby. At this time, I'm, I feel like I'm all by myself. Because, see, I have kind of like this little inner circle of just like three or four people 
that I talk to every now and then, Dan being one. I talk to my mom, have friends in Texas and Alabama I'll talk to. And I couldn't call them during this time because anytime you called them, they were like, what's going on? Is she having the baby? Where are we at? It's like, and Dan would go, Shauna! And it would be like, and I'd be like, I just needed a talk. I just needed a talk. So she doesn't have the baby on October 3rd. She doesn't have the baby October 4th. October 5th comes, Shauna's birthday. Shauna said that's the day. Now, mind you, everybody's telling me at work all these kinds of wives' tales and all these kinds of things. If you take, tell her to take milk and magnesia, tell her to do this, tell her to do that, and she's getting tired of me even telling her all this stuff. And then you have the spiritual wives' tales. It's going to be born on October 5th because five is the number of grace. That's the day the baby will be born. Okay. It's not, it can't be born on October 6th because that's the number of man. So the baby can't be born on that day. So October 6th comes, the baby's not here. So then October 7th, well, we all know seven is God's perfect number. That's the day. And also the other wife's tale, the barometric pressure is now dropping. So that should work too. So Hannah would wake up and she got so tired. Her mom's there now and she gets so tired of us because we go, how do you feel? It's like, how are you feeling right now? How are you feeling about this? Well, then October the 8th, that's the day. Because eight in Hebrew means new beginning. And the blood moon is that day. The blood moons. That's the day. I'm like, whatever. So that day comes, that day goes. So now I'm in the shower. And I'm like, when is this baby coming? I mean, we've done everything the old wives said to do. We've done everything the old prophets said to do. When's it coming? And I was in the shower, and I heard God say to me, I know her birthday. And he said it to me in a way I could see it. He said, and I have it circled on my calendar. I have it circled on my calendar. Let me tell you something. God knows your day. God knows your future. You may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be. God knows your due date. God knows the due date. God knows it. He's the author and he's the finisher. He's the complete one. He's complete it all. Not the old wives' tales. Not, not all. If you just pray harder, Dave, it'll happen. No. He knows the date. It's circled. It's dotted. He knows exactly the time. But you know what's funny? Because I make fun of the old Hebrew prophets and all that. The baby was born at 555 on 1010. So five is the number of grace, and ten is the perf is a perfect number. Is a complete means complete and perfect. So you know what? God already knew the date. And in our lives, we try to figure out our due date. We try to figure this out. When is the church going to be this way? Or when are we going to do this? Or when are we going to do that? I'm just glad we're not where we used to be. Real fast, I'm going to tell you where we used to be. Here's where it used to be. My mom would stand right here. And then Dan, he would stand right here. And then Lisa would stand next to Dan. And then we had these transparencies. Remember them? And, and the old projector. And Dan would put the, no, Lisa would put the music on the projector. Dan would take it off. And that was the worship band. And every Sunday, Dan would sing, What a Mighty God We Serve. It was his favorite song. It was great times, but we're not where we used to be, are we? Thank God we're not where we used to be. Now, if we got to do it, we'll do it. But we're not where we, used to, where we used to be. And we're going to someplace greater. We're going to someplace greater. Someplace better than we've ever seen. Some place that we're some place that nobody's ever seen it before. Let's not fall into a comparison thing either. 
You know what? He's the author. God doesn't write the same book for everybody. He writes a different book for each and every one of our lives. So because Dave is having a better week than mine doesn't mean that I'm missing God. Because Dan had a better week than I did doesn't mean that I miss God this week. No. Doesn't mean that I've missed God one bit. It just means that the contractions are still coming a little bit. The epidural is still kicking in. It's still kicking in. But it will kick in. And when it does, it's a great thing. You can have peace when the world doesn't think we should. We can be at ease when the world thinks we should be rushing around. We can do these things. So just bow your heads for a minute. We've got a couple other things we need to do today. So let's just bow our heads. And Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you that you have a plan and a purpose and a direction for our lives. And we thank you, Father, that it is good and it is of peace and it is not of harm. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room. And, Father, I just pray right now that, Lord, that you will just give them visions and give them dreams, Father. That, Father, that they will not concentrate on what's going on around them and they will not be distracted, but, Lord, they will look to Jesus. They will look to Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you right now for Jesus. And, Father, we just thank you, Father, for each and every person in this room. And, Father, for the ones that may be in here that do not know you today and have not accepted you. Father, we thank you that today is the day of salvation. Today is their day. Lord, today is their day for a fresh start, for peace, for joy. So, Lord, we thank you for that right now. And if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, today's the day. And so I just invite you right now just to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I believe that you exist. And I turn from my old ways. And I turn to you. I thank you. For the life that you have given to me, and I will live for you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved. You are saved. And so, Father, we just thank you. We seal this word up in you right now. And Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing and what you are setting into motion for us individually and corporately. And Lord, we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen.